we're talking about, and specifically even in that extended intelligence, you're talking about government, you're talking about private industry, academia. Where should the center of that research live if there is a center? I think it's a good question. I think that MIT would argue it should be at MIT. <laughs> um, I, you know, and I think it's uh, this this round is 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 quite shocking. I think to the academics because most of the money and the power of the core computer sciences and big companies, um, and even OpenAI that some of our friends made, um, that was a nonprofit um, and not inside an academic institution. And I think it's sort of surprising, right? Yeah, historically it would have probably been a group of academics with the government. So this is a a, a new thing. Um, but I feel like as we start to emerge out of just the computer science mode to how does this affect society mode, for, for instance, just take, you know, w one of the areas that we're really interested in is criminal justice, um, bail and, and parole. The, um, that's probably much better to have a statistical AI supporting the, the, the judge. But, but then it's not just about whether it's more efficient. You don't want to be judged by a machine, right? So, so, so these, as we start to move out, I think it'll be interesting to see who gets involved. I think as you start to get into the social sciences and the law and the philosophy, that becomes more in government and academia. But, but it is curious, and, and I think that just we, we, we can't compete, or we, um, academia can't compete um, from the, 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 these guys are getting paid millions of dollars at postdoc levels. They've got a tremendous amount of resources. So, so I think we have to kind of assume, now, now, but now um, the military are, 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 are talking about uh, uh, you know, funding AI, so there may be another player that has a lot of money. But right now, most of the billion dollar labs, all of them are, are really uh, yeah. in, in business. Well, look, uh, they, I mean, we, we know the guys who are funding them, and yeah. you know, if you talk to Larry or others, uh, you know, their general attitude, understandably, is uh, the last thing we want is a bunch of bureaucrats and you know, that are slowing us down here as we, you know, chase uh, you know, the, the, the unicorn out there. Part of the problem that we've seen in, is that our general commitment as a society to basic research has diminished. Our confidence in collective action has been chipped away, uh, partly because of ideology and rhetoric. Um, and so if the notion is if it's government, it's bad. And um, that's something that I do think needs to be reversed. Uh, now that requires government to be more nimble, faster, quicker, smarter. Uh, it's hard in a big democracy with a lot of diverse views sometimes to get it moving uh, fast enough in, in the direction that something like AI is moving. It's, it's moving so rapidly that uh, sometimes government's always playing catch up. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 the analogy that we still use 50 years later when it comes to a great technological achievement is a moonshot. moonshot. And uh, somebody reminded me, maybe been one of you, that th the space program was a half a percent of GDP. And that doesn't sound like a lot, 0.5 percent of GDP, but in today's dollars, that'd be 80 billion dollars <laughs> that we would be spending annually on AI. And right now, we're spending by less than a billion. That undoubtedly will accelerate, but part of what we're going to have to understand is that if we want the values of a diverse community represented in these breakthrough technologies, then government funding has to be a part of it. If government is not part of financing it, then understandably uh, those who uh, pay the piper call the tune. And all the issues that you know, Joy's raised about the values embedded in these technologies uh, end up being uh, potentially lost, uh, or at least not properly debated. You bring up a really interesting tension there that, Joey, you've written about um, that idea of innovation happening on the margins or at the edges, mm -hmm. and then with the space program and NASA really centrally governed. How does that relationship change this, this kind of development and thinking about where the, the transmission of those ideas can happen. Well, I want to emphasize that the way we now think about crowd wisdom, essentially, and a bunch of experiments everywhere, uh, I, I think that can accelerate rather than impede progress. 
um, as long as everybody's linked together with a sense of common purpose and responsibility and accountability. That, just to give a very concrete example, part of our project in precision medicine is to gather a big enough database of human genomes from a diverse enough set of Americans, all kinds of racial types, ethnic types, body types, you name it, gender, that instead of financing medical research where we give the money to Stanford or Harvard or some other school and they've got their samples and they're hoarding them and they're working on it and you know, it's a very linear process. You know, now have this entire database that everybody has access to and the potential to short circuit the, the research process before you've got promising candidates for treatment you know, can be hugely accelerated because people aren't all holding on to their stuff. And you know, that's the power of the internet, that's the power of connectivity and the, the networked world that we live in. What I've tried to emphasize though is, is that just because the government is, is financing it and, and helping to collect the data, it doesn't mean that we hoard it or only the military has it or uh, it's got to be a top-down approach. But there does have to be some common set of uh, values, a, a, a common architecture, to make sure that uh, the research is shared by people, that it's not monetized by one group rather than another, uh, and uh, there, there has to be some core principles that we all agree to, and, and that's, I think, uh, an appropriate role that some, a group like NIH, for example, can play. And I think that um, if you look at the moonshot, a lot of the value were the tools that were created in order to do that. Or if you look at CERN, they've got some esoteric physics problem, but they invent the web while right. they're at it. You know? and, and so I think these mega projects bring together an interdisciplinary group to solve a problem. And so that's really interesting. And I think one of the problems with standard peer-reviewed um, government funding is it goes out in this kind of hierarchical pattern that's very politically correct and very rigorous, but it doesn't really get these big ideas going. Right. And I would say the other thing that you have that you're doing well is the open data initiative, right? So when you're talking about AI, you need data. The government has data. And um, I, I, I helped start a nonprofit in Japan after Fukushima to get citizens to collect data on um, radiation measurements. We have 53 million of them. We did right. well. And so we came to Washington, D.C., and we did a workshop. We invited the, IPA, uh, uh, the EPA guys and the NSS, and NSSA guys, and, and they had all the data, but they hadn't, it was open, but it wasn't published. And we showed that, and, and actually there's data around the White House that was, like, for national security, they didn't publish. Right. And, we, and we invited all those guys, and, um, and, and our guys taught them how to make the kits, and they walked around and measured the radiation around here. And they said, well, now that it's public, we can release the data. And what's now developed is just a bunch of citizen science kids, a lot of them in Japan, now working with the EPA and the and NSA in, in trying to figure out how do you take radiation data, empower citizens, and then we're selling these kids into, these kits into high schools and pivoting into uh, to, 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 to air and things like that. And, it's, it's, and what's interesting is if you get kids that are sufficiently motivated, the kids on the edges, and give them some sort of interface to this data. And I think that right now, your agencies are getting much more sort We're of inclusive. And, 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 and it used to be you'd talk to some professor at some university and give them limited access to the data. Right. But it turns out that, that kids will figure out how to use the data. And, and right now, it's mostly visualization. But once we get AI, a farmer may be able to go d direct to uh, collect the data, build a model, and right. use AI to, to do something. And that's just going to be a lot of how tools get better, but also how the government interacts with those people. Yeah.